tremendous advantage over trying to just pedal uh, a large heavy vehicle and then you also have the flexibility to carry your friends with you or um, go shopping, uh, carry large things, go to Home Depot, just go down around the corner to get a bunch of groceries, you name it. There's just all this space available to do anything you like. Or more bicycle parts. <laughs> Or my, or more by, bi or more bicycles. Actually, I've carried bicycles in the front of it too. So the vehicle I'm currently focused on making is um, I've done both. I've built both uh, electric assist cargo trikes, which is the box version, and also electric assist rickshaws, which is sort of more designed for carrying people. Um, but at the moment, I'm really primarily focused on the box version because it's just sort of a, a more generally versatile shape. Right. Now, a lot of the three-wheeled, human-powered vehicles I've seen have one wheel in the front and two in the back. Yours you call a tadpole design with two wheels in the front and one in the back. Now, could you tell me what are the advantages, disadvantages of doing that design? Um, yeah, so I don't, well, I don't call it tadpole in that that's actually a good, you know, engineering term. I don't know. It's sort of a, a conventional term for that sort of vehicle. If you have two wheels in front and one in back, whether, regardless of whether it's a recumbent or you name it. Um, and the reason that I do two wheels in the front is when you're, um, when you're going at higher speeds, uh, you know, 25 miles an hour, as opposed to a traditional tricycle, which often was only like maybe 5 or 10 miles an hour because you're just pedaling. Um, to have two wheels in the front is a much safer, um, more stable architecture than to have them in the back. Um, it has uh, a lot to do with the ability to uh, stop effectively uh, because then you can have your braking power where all of the weight and the force is going when you're stopping quickly. It also helps with going because that also means that your motorized wheels, because the two wheels in the front are the ones that have the motors in them, um, that also means you've got a lot of power pulling you, which can actually act as a steering stabilizer as you're accelerating. And then having the hydraulic disc brake system in the front also means that you have this kind of equalizing pressure for stopping. So, in fact, um, because tricycles are stable vehicles, but not as stable as a four-wheel vehicle, you're always thinking about stability first and everything else second. So that's the primary reason is for going and stopping more safely and effectively and as a steering stabilizer. Um, secondary reasons include being able to keep an eye on your cargo because a lot of times when people are traveling by bike, they've got maybe a trailer, so they strap it down, they think it's good, and then they just forget about it. Well, what if you get five miles down the road and you realize, oh, some of your load has fallen off? Well, with uh, your cargo in the front, that isn't an issue. You can kind of keep an eye on what's going on and keep an eye on the road. Now, even better, if your cargo is your friend or if your cargo is your daughter, um, that means that you can keep an eye on your friend or talk to your friend while you're actually driving down the road. And so it's safer because you're not tempted to turn around to talk to them so they can hear you um, and then, you know, crash into something because something in front of you has changed. So that's, I think those are the two biggest reasons. And then there's a lot of other lesser reasons. <laughs> okay, so safety and control. You have improved safety and control. Um, and improved um, social dynamic, I think, mm -hmm. is a big part of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And how did you get started with Frank and Trikes? Ooh. Um, so it's actually a really long story. Um, it all, um, I'll try and make it brief. Okay. Um, it all started, um, it wasn't planned, um, it all started with a terrible day that I had back in 1997 when I was driving a car and then another car that didn't see a yield sign uh, plowed right into my driver's side door at 40 miles an hour. Oh my god. And so uh, that was an interesting day that uh, sent shockwaves through the next 
you know, for the rest of my life because uh, there was an ambulance ride involved and a little bit of time in the hospital and then um, a long recovery period um, where, needless to say, I was not driving. Um, and there was a lot of changes that happened in my life at that time. Um, I lost my partner. Um, we had a business together. The business, I uh, sold my half of the business to him. Uh, my apartment was demolished. Uh, so I was out of work. Um, I didn't, a lot of things were very difficult at the time. I guess you could say what happened is that car accident sort of disrupted my regularly scheduled programming. Uh, and so losing everything and starting over somehow bicycles were involved with that um, and at, there was a time when I spent out of the city uh, living in in nature and then what came organically out of that process is I ended up bicycling to Mexico and for that and again none of this was really like planned as in oh this is what I'm gonna do um, I ended up towing a four foot by six foot trailer with a mountain bike, hauling all of my cooking and camping gear all the way from Reno down into deep into northern Mexico. Um, and that experience I, I now attribute to the beginning of thinking about moving things by bicycle, but also it was a very physically demanding task. Um, I rode 1,200 miles in two months, towing probably somewhere between um, 100 and 200 and some pounds of food and things. Um, again, there's lots of details I'm living out here. And then that was followed shortly by re a return to my home city of Seattle and uh, the planning for my next Burning Man, which had been a, a yearly ritual when I built uh, a rickshaw because I thought, well, hey, you know, I just bicycled to Mexico carrying all this stuff. Wouldn't it be nice to carry people instead? So I built a rickshaw, and then I was, that was my role at Burning Man that year. I became a, a taxi driver. Um, and so then that was really the first tricycle I built, and that was back in 2000. Well, you know, out on the playa where it's really flat, uh, it was easy to pedal around a giant thing with people in it. But then back in my hometown of Seattle, I was like, man, you know, sometimes I take it out for special events or parties or whatever. It, it was fun. It was very interactive. It had sound. It had lights. It had a crazy canopy. It had tiki lamps. It had all kinds of stuff. It was a, it was a wacky party machine. And um, it was really fun, but man, it was hard to pedal. And I had this giant car battery mounted underneath the seat. And I was thinking, man, you know, and that, that car battery is for the sound, for the stereo system and for the lights and all. But I was thinking, you know, wouldn't it be great if this battery could actually power the wheels because darn, it's exhausting to pedal this thing around Seattle with my friends. I'd love to have fun, but instead I'm just suffering. <laughs> And um, it was several years later when, um, you know, that just kind of stewed in the back of my mind. It was several years later before I met a fellow who actually had just started importing components uh, to convert regular bikes to electric assist bikes or e-bikes. And he knew all about this stuff. And I thought, you know... We should be buddies. <laughs> <laughs> so he could pick his brain, basically. <laughs> I picked his brain for a year. In fact, I picked his brain to the point where I moved up to the city he lived in, which was Vancouver, and um, that's where I built, um, actually, the vehicle that I drive today, which was the first electric assist tricycle. And that was a cargo trike, or, you know, box trike uh, style, like um, Paul said, with two wheels in the front. So both of them had two wheels in the front. Um, and then, so I guess that's where it all began. Okay, well, <laughs> I could see, you know, if, if you have a car crash, a lot of times it's like after the crash, you don't want to drive. You know, it's like it just brings back all those memories of that trauma and stuff. Well, and, and your car is gone. <laughs> yeah, you don't have a car. You don't have a car. <laughs> um, yeah, so, yeah, it's a combination of the bad memories mm -hmm. and um, simply not having one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
So I'm, I'm just trying to picture you out in the desert bicycling with this big trailer behind you and heading down into Mexico. Did people stop you along the way and ask stupid questions? Um, actually, most of the people that stopped along the way um, asked if I needed a ride because <laughs> 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 they felt bad for me. <laughs> um, I actually turned all of them down um, except for one in a, in a place where there wasn't enough space for me to pedal and have the cars pass. Yeah. But otherwise, I promised myself I was going to do it all on my own power. And so I did. But I met lots of kind people along the way. Oh, all right. So positive experience? Challenging but positive overall. Yeah, I actually met some famous people and had some amazing experiences. So. Okay. So when I first met you, it was at the Berkeley Spark, which was like a mini Burning Man or getting people ready for the Burning Man. And you were quite gracious and answering all my questions at the time. And since then, you've launched this Kickstarter campaign and then sort of put it on hold temporarily and I've been getting your emails and following the progress and I'm wondering if you could just read the message that you sent out to people about your Kickstarter campaign and then the other one about why you put it on hold. Yeah, well that's what that's funny because actually I went back to the video that you uh, interview made of me at Spark mm -hmm. a couple of years ago and I was talking about doing this fundraising campaign and mm -hmm. now I'm actually doing it. Mm -hmm. um, it's been, um, I knew it would be hard, um, but it was harder than expected. It was a lot more hours of work than you would think to prepare to have a fundraising campaign on Kickstarter. And so, um, yeah, so what happened is that um, I almost feel like I want to read the second one first. Okay. Um, which is where I kind of talk about it, it not going... Not, so we launched, but then I actually canceled the campaign after a week because I could see it wasn't going to go. You see, with Kickstarter, it's all or nothing, and the amount that we were trying to raise is 50000 And that's actually quite a lot of money. Um, it's a small amount for this project, but it's a large amount to ask from uh, your world in a short period of 30 to 40 days. So here's what I read as the final update when I canceled. Frank and Trake's fans. Cam the campaign launch didn't go smoothly. A week after the campaign launch, we had just 16 backers. I've canceled the campaign in order to regroup. I am now able to see how the absence of outreach support impacted the campaign. Throughout the preparations, I have had a 50% success rate of working with others. 50% came through as promised and 50% failed to deliver. Unfortunately, the PR team I hired was of the 50% that failed. <laughs> it was not clear that they had completely dropped the ball until only two weeks before the actual launch. There are further details about this on the campaign page in update number three. This left a huge void in the realm of outreach, which became painfully apparent on launch day. The outreach plan and outreach actions, which had been entrusted to the team, simply didn't happen. A lot has been accomplished in the past few months, and you can see the results with a stellar video, campaign presentation, new logos, and landing page. Frankentrakes is a big project, and 50000 is a lot of money to raise in 30 days. By canceling now, we save time, energy, and money and can regroup and relaunch in a couple of months on the Kickstarter platform or another. Most of the campaign, campaign presentation work is done, so now all that energy can be redirected towards outreach. Um, you know, and then... Yeah, I just say thanks again for being an active and caring part of an important movement away from fossil fuel dependency. Um, so, so that was, uh, you know, mainly the issue is that there was outreach that needed to be prepared because when you're doing a campaign, you actually have to organize everything ahead of time. You can't just launch and then go, oh, now what do I do? Call my mom? You know? <laughs> yeah. So you, it's, you have to reach like a lot of people because you have very little time. It's sort of how the whole thing's set up. I guess that urgency is what um, helps people to focus, um, both for the people 
launching the campaign and the people that want to support the project. But it also makes it uh, very stressful and um, a lot of work in terms of advanced preparation. And I was spending so much time and energy just getting the video together and the rewards together and, you know, writing everything up that I didn't have time to actually prepare that part. And because my, my PR people didn't do it, there was just, it just kind of didn't get done. <laughs> so... Okay, so relaunch it in a couple of months and try again then. Yeah, and um, I'm very optimistic about that because actually even in the week that we were launched, um, even with the little bit of outreach that I was able to do, um, I hired one of these, you know, Kickstarter PR <laughs> crews that you, you know, they, they reach out to you after you've launched and say, hey, we like your project and if you give us a few hundred bucks, we'll help you and all. And, you know, <laughs> reaching out to these guys, reaching out to friends, family. Um, even in that week, I learned so much about what was working, what wasn't working. Um, I had a massive amount of return feedback, outreach. There were people that um, are sort of in my industry that run pedicab companies or are frame builders that wanted to meet me and talk to me and find out how we can work together. Um, the bicycle world is such a cooperative um, a wonderful, it's a wonderful ecosystem. It's, there's so many wonderful and generous, uh, people in that world and everyone's trying to help each other. We're working with what we've got and we're trying to, to make our cities a better place, to make our world a better place. And, uh, so even though we were not able to move forward at this moment, a lot of good things have come out of it. I'm getting a lot of good advice now from people who are experienced in outreach and who have done Kickstarters. And, um, and so I am very confident that with proper organization and preparation that this, this could actually go. Okay. And on one level, you're sort of reinventing the wheel. But on, on the other hand, there's lots of people moving in the same direction away from cars and toward human-powered vehicles or, you know, battery-assist-powered vehicles. And I think it's really, it's going to save our cities because as it is with the traffic in the cities, it becomes unsustainable and it's just downright poisonous because, you know, just one car, you know, puts out enough smog to kill a whole room full of people. I mean, you multiply that times a thousand, five thousand, ten thousand. It's amazing we're not all choking on car exhaust smoke at the moment. I guess because we're on the West Coast and it, it blows east, you know, people in the Midwest get to breathe it or it goes down to San Jose, I guess. But it, it's amazing, you know, just the number of cars that are out there. Yeah, that's right. Um, actually, it does affect people here. Um, there, it's, there's been a documented um, fairly high rate of respiratory illnesses among children in West Oakland, for example, um, during the drought um, when it wasn't raining. I live um, just east of downtown Oakland, and I was having problems with uh, my eyes burning, uh, my sinuses burning, my ears itching. I was sneezing for hours every day. Just from wow. just um, every morning uh, during rush hour and right after, so I was suffering so much that I put new screens on my window. I was thinking about getting an air filter, which is not really something I've ever seriously considered doing. <laughs> um, and I was seriously thinking of moving out of the apartment I was in. It was so bad, and it wasn't until the rains came that I could breathe again, and that almost all my symptoms went away. But uh, the pollution that we create you know, from all the freeways and, and from driving everywhere all the time for every, for every reason and no reason really does have an impact. And I don't even consider myself the most sensitive person out there. There's other people that, you know, practically have to put a mask on just to leave the house. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so. Well, <laughs> I, I can remember the uh, Bicycle Liberation Army in Berkeley and they, their motto was, two wheels good, four wheels bad, and then the other one was they said one less car. <laughs> yeah, one less car. So I think that's where a lot of the bicycle people 
everyone's got their own idea of what's the best kind of vehicle to get around. You know, there's the pedicab people, there's the bike, the cargo bike people, there's the electric bike people. There's, But I think what we share is that desire to bring back a sense of place, a sense of community, um, to get out of the boxes, to uh, help people to see what they're missing, because I think that the car um, can be a very effective way to go a long distance when you have to go really fast. But if you're always in it all the time in your own city, in your own neighborhood, you miss a lot of what's going on around you and you really feel very separated and, and decontextualized from your local environment. And I feel that one of the things that the bicycle does is it kind of starts to reconnect you to that sense of place and, and to realizing, well, this is where you are. This is where I am. You know, what am I going to make of it? What, you know, how can I make my home and my community better? And I think that when you don't really have to be where you're at, I think it's, there's sort of a, a shutting out of what's not pleasant rather than sort of an embracing of what's real and then working with that, which, which always seems to bring greater benefits than that kind of denial <laughs> approach. <laughs> okay, well, we're going to take a short break and listen to some music by Janice Whaley, and then we'll be right back. This is Berkeley Liberation Radio. You're tuned to the World Cruise with Captain Fred, and we'll be right back.